Welcome to this introductory video about runtime or algorithm analysis. If you are a computer science student taking your first round of computer science classes, you've probably heard this term. Before we dive in too deep, I want to familiarize you with some terms and tell you what runtime isn't. Here are a few terms which are necessary before we get started. Algorithm, a set of rules and commands that work together to accomplish a task. Runtime, an asymptotic measurement of an algorithm. Atomic operation, a set or block of code that accomplishes a specific task without being interrupted. Data, any input by a user or information traversed in an algorithm is considered data. We refer to data as n in the video, where n represents the count of something which must be utilized by the algorithm. Keep in mind that during this video, when we look at graphical representations of growth rates, the x in our graph is what we represent with n, and that's what we're referring to for runtime. So in this video, x and n are interchangeable. Runtime notation. When referring to the runtime of an algorithm, we will use notation that is learned in discrete math, which are big O, big omega, and big theta. Asymptotic complexity. A mathematical measurement which ignores all lowercase terms and all constant multipliers. Although these definitions may sound daunting at first, don't worry, we'll cover them before the end of the video. Next, let's talk about what runtime isn't. Runtime is not the speed or clock time at which your machine or any machine can process an algorithm. For example, an algorithm may take two minutes on a laptop to run, but that same exact algorithm may only take one second on a supercomputer. Therefore, measuring the runtime using the time on a clock face or a stopwatch isn't reliable. So what is runtime? Runtime is a measurement which determines mathematically the growth of an algorithm. When I say it's a mathematical measurement, I mean that the growth of the algorithm is compared to its asymptotic complexity, and well, it sounds complex, but it really isn't that bad. Before we get started, let's do a little review from math. We are going to briefly touch on functions and their growth. Let's say we have a function f of n equal to n. If we graph f of n, we get a graph that looks like this. As you can see, f of n here is linear because y grows at the same rate as x, or n as we refer to it for runtime. Therefore, when f of n is equal to n and n is equal to 5, we know that f of 5 is equal to 5. Therefore, y and x grow at the same rate. If we have f of n equal to n square, then we see our glorious parabola. Well, at least the half of it that's in the quadrant one of our graph. Here we can see that y grows exponentially faster than x when x is greater than one. Therefore, when f of n equals n squared and n is equal to five, we know that f of five is equal to 25. If we have f of n is equal to n cubed, then we see our line appear in the graph in quadrant one. Here you can see that y grows even faster than x when x is greater than 1. Therefore, when f of n equals n cubed and n is equal to 5, we know that f of 5 is equal to 125. If we have f of n is equal to the log of n, we can't take the log of 0, so we always start with x equals 1. We can see here that the growth rate of log of n is very slow. Therefore, when f of n is equal to log of n, and n is equal to 5, we know that f of 5 is equal to 0 0.698970 and some other numbers, and that isn't even a 1 yet, so it, the growth rate is very slow. If we have f of n equals n log of n, the growth rate looks similar to a linear function, but it's slightly curved and growing a little faster than linear once n is greater than 10. Therefore, when f of n is equal to n log of n, and n is equal to 5, we know that f of 5 is equal to 3.4948. I just wanted to review those graphs to remind you of how different the growth rates can be for various functions. I want to touch on asymptotic complexity before we continue by looking at a more complex function on a graph. Let's work with this function. f of n is equal to n squared plus 2n plus 5, which would look like this on the graph. Remember the definition of asymptotic complexity is a mathematical measurement which ignores all lower order terms and all constant multipliers. If we look at the asymptotic complexity of our function f of n, we only look at the term containing n which has the highest degree. So in this case, 
we'll give it a different function name, g of n for clarity, and g of n is equal to n squared. n squared is the term of the highest degree when we ignore all lower order terms and constant multipliers. Therefore, if we graph both f of n and g of n, this is what the graph looks like. The purple line represents f of n, and the pink line represents g of n. As you can see, although they start at different y values on the graph, as n approaches infinity, the growth rate of both functions are the same. Therefore, g of n is our asymptotic complexity for our function f of n. This is important to understand, and you'll see why as we continue through the video. Since we use asymptotic complexity for runtime notation, let's take a look at why the constant multipliers and all lower order terms are not used as part of the notation. Let's say we had two functions, f of n equals log of n plus 100, and g of n equals n plus 10. If I ask you which of the two functions would grow faster, you might choose f of n simply because it's adding 100 in the function, while g of n only adds 10. Although it may seem logical when we first glance at the two functions, we cannot consider only one instance of the function. We have to look at the collective growth of the function as n approaches infinity. When we graph both of these functions, we can see each starts with a different y value on the graph. If we look at the growth of each function, we see that g of n has a much steeper upward slope as n approaches infinity, and g of n actually intersects f of n when n reaches approximately 90. Therefore, we can see by this comparison that the lower order terms and the constant multipliers become negligible as n approaches infinity. Therefore, we only use the term which has the highest degree of n and not the entire function in the runtime notation. Let's talk about atomic operations, as some early computer science students may have a little trouble grasping this idea at first. The brief definition in chemistry of an atom is the smallest portion into which an element can be divided and still retain its properties. This also applies to an algorithm as a function that cannot be interrupted while running in order to produce the proper results. So in chemistry, the atom must retain its properties, and in an algorithm, the algorithm must run without interruption in order to retain its properties or purpose. Does this mean that the atomic operation only has one command? No, not at all. It can contain multiple commands which accomplish one task, but in order to accomplish the task, it cannot be interrupted. A good example is if you were calculating the sum of 1 through 5, you wouldn't want to type 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus, and then start a different equation like 6 times 8, and then go back to plus 4 plus 5, and expect the calculator to know exactly what you were trying to accomplish, because what you wanted to do was 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, but it was interrupted with 6 times 8. Therefore, once an atomic operation starts, it must finish without interruption to produce the proper results. Here's the code for calculating the sum of 1 through 5 in a method appropriately named sum. The number 5 would be passed into the method, and then the calculation would begin and would not be interrupted. Therefore, the method sum is an atomic operation. Let's talk about the letter n we keep seeing in all these functions. As the primary parameter of your algorithm, n can represent a number of things. n might be the degree of a polynomial, the count of records in a database, the size of a string, or some other measurement which determines the size of the problem being considered. For example, when we were calculating the sum of 1 through 5, we used a set or a collection of data that looked like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in a set of curly braces. Therefore, n equals 5, since we had 5 elements in our set. It's just a coincidence that n equaled 5, and there's 5 elements, so let's take a look at another example. If we had a phone book database full of contact names, our data set may look like this. In set of curly braces, we may have Alice, Bill, Craig, David, Edward, and Frank. Therefore, in this case, n would equal 6, since we have 6 elements in our database collection. As you can see, n equates to the number of elements in a set or collection being used in the algorithm. Alright, now that the not-so-short introduction is over, let's start taking a look at algorithm runtime. Let's look at the notation we will use to describe runtime. As mentioned before, we are going to cover big O, 
big omega, and big theta. Big theta denotes the same as, which represents a tight bound. Big O denotes growth slower than, or the same as, which represents an upper bound. Big omega, which denotes faster than, or the same as, represents a lower bound. Little o denotes fewer than, and little omega denotes more than. In this video, we will cover big theta and big O. So far, we've reviewed the growth rate of various functions and atomic operations, and let's start putting it all together to understand the runtime. Let's look at big theta first. Here we have a function, which is an atomic operation, that is linear in growth because the number of times the algorithm has to loop is the same as the value of n. As you can see in the code, n is the argument passed to the function, and we enter 10 to get the results we have here. k is set to equal n, and then k is manipulated n number of times. If thinking of it on a graph, the count represents the value of y, and as mentioned earlier, n represents the value of x. This is a very common algorithm, and one of its common uses is to perform a sequential search. For the notation of this algorithm, we will say that f of n has a runtime of theta n since the function must go through the while loop n number of times. We use the count variable to count the number of times that the algorithm has to go through a particular loop. Theta of n means that the growth of the function, which is the count, is the same as n, and n represents the number of elements in the collection. If thinking about it on a graphing calculator, it means that x equals y. So here the theta is a tight bound, which means it goes through the loop exactly n number of times. Here we have a method that is quadratic in growth. As you can see in the code, n is the argument passed to the quadratic method, and we use 10 n in our example for output. We can tell this algorithm is quadratic in growth because it has two nested for loops, each of them being dependent on the value of n. The first for loop is accessed and i is set to zero, and then the second for loop begins and runs n number of times, and j starts at zero and runs while j is less than n, which is 10 in this case. Then the second for loop is finished. Since we are still inside the first for loop, it increments by one, which means that i is now equal to one, and the second for loop starts again, and j begins at zero and runs n number of times. So you can see how this ends up being a quadratic function. One of the most common uses for a method like this is one like selection sort. For the notation of this algorithm, we will say that f of n has a runtime of theta n squared since the function must go through the while loops n squared number of times. Remember that theta n squared means that the growth of the function is the same as n squared where n represents the number of elements in the collection. Here we have a method that is cubic in growth. As you can see in the code, n is the argument passed to the cubic method, and we enter 10 in our example. We can tell this algorithm is quadratic in growth because it has three nested for loops, and each of them are dependent upon the value of n. It starts out similar to our n squared function, but you can see the extra loop is just like multiplying n squared times n, which of course makes the function n cubed. This type of algorithm is used to multiply n by n matrices. For the notation of this algorithm, we will say that f of n has a runtime of theta n cubed, since the function must go through the while loops n cubed number of times. Remember that theta n cubed means that the growth of the function is the same as n cubed, and n represents the number of elements in our collection. Here we have a method that is log of n in growth. As you can see in the code, n is the argument passed to the log method, and we enter 10 in our example for output. We can tell this algorithm is log of n because it is dividing n into smaller parts each time it goes through the loop. Here we can see that k is equal to n, and then k is divided by 2 while k is greater than 1. Once k is equal to 1, our results print. As you can see, the method only needed to go through the while loop three times before the condition of k less than 1 was met. For the notation of this algorithm, 
we will say that f of n has a runtime of theta log of n, since the function only had to go through the while loop log n number of times. Remember that theta log of n means that the growth of the function is the same as log n and represents the number of elements in the collection. Notice in the output that log of n is 3.32 and the loop count is 3, so it's basically the same. Here we have a method that is n log of n in growth. As you can see in the code, n is the argument passed to the log linear method and we entered 10 for our example for output. We can tell this algorithm is n log of n because it goes to the for loop n number of times and then there is a nested while loop inside the for loop and the while loop is a log of n function. Anytime nested loops exist, nested for loops or nested while loops, or as we see here, a while loop nested inside a for loop, we have to multiply the runtime of the first loop by the runtime of the second loop. Therefore, we get n log of n for runtime. This function has a runtime of theta n log of n. In the output, we can see that n log n and n log n divided by 2 are just two possible exemplars in theta n log of n. Both of them are displayed to compare the actual count, which falls between them. I think now you have an idea of how the count can be used to approximate the runtime of your algorithm for algorithms with a runtime of big theta. Now let's look at some big O functions. We have modified the linear algorithm and now there is an if statement appearing in the while loop. This if statement can cause the loop to terminate early because it may terminate while k is still greater than zero, which is the condition of the while loop. We know that in a regular linear function that the value of the function grows linearly with a value of n. However, in this case, the growth of the function may stop when the condition of the if statement is met. The condition could be met after one loop or many loops, or it could go all the way through until the condition is met. In this case, the algorithm does not go through the loop an exact or tight number of times. We will say that the linear big O function has a runtime of big O of n because the growth of the function, as represented by the count, is slower than or the same as n. We can also say that the worst case runtime would be big O of n, meaning that it would run at most n times. In our example, we can see that the algorithm only had to loop two times until it met the condition of the if statement. Now this is less than 10, which is the value of n. Therefore, since it's less than n, our algorithm runtime is big O of n. Let's look at the quadratic function that had two nested loops. That function had a runtime of theta n squared because it always ran n squared number of times. However, what happens when we have an algorithm that may not go through the loop n number of times? We're going to use the quadratic function, but we are placing an if statement inside the innermost for loop. The if statement basically states to exit the for loop if the inner for loop value of j equals the value of m that we input. This would be similar to searching the cells of an n by n matrix for a specific value. Once the value is found, there is no need to continue the loop, so a break occurs. We will call the function as quadratic big O, n, m, with 10 and 8 representing the arguments respectively. Once j equals 8, the for loop is exited. As we can see, our output is different. The loop count is no longer 100 as it was with the theta n squared algorithm, but the loop count is only 80. Remember that big theta is considered a tight bound and big O is considered an upper bound. Therefore, the runtime of this algorithm is big O n squared because the loop count may be less than or equal to n squared. Now let's take a look at a real world example of importing data into a database and show how runtime can drastically affect the outcome of your program. Two FSU Panama City undergraduate students were working on a project in a database structures class. The project was called the Kevin Bacon Game and it was a program to show the degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon to other actors or actresses based on movies which each actor or actress appeared 
which links them to yet another movie where another actor or actress may appear. The students were given a text file of 4,188 records and each had to be imported into a vector. The progress was slow going at first as the import would take over two hours each time they attempted to import from the text file into the vectors. Originally, during the import, the program would have to dynamically assign the memory for the next element to be added into the vector, which means they were using nested loops. This was causing the program to have a runtime of theta n squared. That meant that the program had to loop n squared number of times, and with 4,188 records in the file, that meant that it had to loop 17 million 539,344 times to go through each record and dynamically assign the memory and then write the value to the element. The function that was performing the import had a runtime of theta n squared. At one point, one or maybe both of the students had the idea to statically allocate the memory before attempting to import the records. To do this, they simply ran a for loop to count the records in the file. This for loop had a big theta n runtime, which would have been a count of 4,188. The memory for the vector was then allocated based on the count of the records in the file. The next loop, which imported the information from the file into the vectors, was able to run at big theta n time because it no longer had to statically allocate the memory before inserting the information into the element. By breaking down the process into two individual loops instead of nested loops, the import was able to import all 4,188 records in less than two minutes. This just goes to show that if you have nested loops and you're able to break them down into two individual loops and it will still give you the correct results, that would be the smartest thing to do because you do take it from being a theta n squared runtime to a big theta n time. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope you've been able to learn a little bit more about algorithm analysis and algorithm runtime. Please see the credits at the end of the video.